Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ong, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much for colleagues and friends and students who, who have graciously uh, you know, taken the time to come to hear to me, uh, to hear me speak today. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see that there, there are so many familiar faces. I hope I can do justice to the, your expectation. Although I must say it's more pressure for me when I see my students <laughs> in the audience because then I have to do much better than them. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, uh, it's not prayer time yet. The, uh, I've been uh, asked to give this public lecture and I've suggested that, you know, uh, I like to talk more about uh, President Joko Widodo's uh, foreign policy to see what, 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 is, what has been happening. After all, it is now uh, three and a half years that he's been uh, in charge of uh, the Indonesian government and also the Indonesian uh, foreign policy. And there have been a lot of uh, misconceptions or concerns you know, in, the, in the beginning. So we, we, we like, uh, I like to see whether some of the concerns have been borne out or whether there have been some pleasant surprises. But before we go into the Jokowi's period, let's us have a, a brief flashback to the SBY period. And as you know, in, in the Indonesia, because we have long name, so uh, we like to have uh, abbreviation. It started with Pak Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, which is quite a mouthful. So uh, he called himself SBY. And then after that, everybody calls themselves, you know, Yusuf Kala is Jeka and uh, Jokowi Dodo is Jokowi. Only Prabowo cannot say, you know, you know it's only, you know, uh, he cannot say himself PS, you know, because, uh, because it sounds not terribly important if you're Prabowo, so Bianto is PS, you know. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so if we one look at SBY's uh, foreign policy, he was very much focused on trying to transform Indonesia's international image after years of multidimensional crisis, when you know Indonesia had just come out from a financial crisis, the collapse of the new order government, there were a lot of uh, communal conflicts, uh, regional rebellions, terrorism, riots, and so on and so forth. Uh, so Indonesia was regarded as a you know, it's a problem in Southeast Asia. Indonesia, that had been an anchor of stability throughout the New Order period, became 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 a basket case, basically. Uh, in fact, there were talks about pro possible balkanization of Indonesia. So, SBY, when he were he became the first. Uh, democratically elected president, directly elected president, he really made it a point of trying to transform Indonesia's international image. So his first foreign policy speech uh, in 2005 uh, uh, was very, very important, very seminal, when he talked about Indonesia's international image as being a country where democracy, uh, human rights, uh, democracy, Islam and modernity can walk hand in hand. Because before that, of course, you know, there is Indonesia is basically authoritarian. Uh, Indonesia is based largely moderate Muslim, but it does not really inform politics. Uh, and you know, there was there was no real de decision about what Indonesia was, except that it was a stable new order government under under Suharto. At the time of SBY, 2004, remember a few years before there had been the 911 terrorist attacks and the war on terror. So this international image of Islam being a problem. Uh, somehow Islam is stigmatized as being associated with radicalism, violent, violent extremism, you know, uh, and anti-democratic, anti-women, and, and so on and so forth. And the primary reference point is always the conflict areas in the Middle East. So now Indonesia, by the time of SBY, is beginning to consolidate its democracy. It is, it was already recognized as the third largest democracy. It is the largest uh, uh, Muslim majority nation in the world. It is, the society is very progressive, very outward looking, and women are empowered, and so on and so forth. So it became, you know, a conscious attempt to bring all of these diverse uh, uh, points, which in the past had not really been uh, uh, Working together as as an uh, uh, you know this image this rebranding of Indonesia if you, if you like, and also as Bi is is a very nice guy he he likes everybody so uh, he wanted Indonesia to be like that also so this tagline of one thousand friends zero enemies you know, Indonesia's friend of everybody when there were two guys in conflict, Indonesia would be trying to conciliate them in the middle. You know, Indonesia will not be a party to any, any conflict. 
at the same time, Indonesia is beginning to return to regional activism because prior to that, of course, Indonesia was preoccupied with internal consolidation and, and, and uh, it only started to return to ASEAN when it chaired ASEAN and, and then uh, ushered in ASEAN community in 2003. By the time SBI came, you know, Indonesia's regional activism uh, was fully back in force and Indonesia is also very active in trying to uh, develop the wider uh, East Asian regional architecture that is inclusive in nature. You know, Martina Talagawa talked about dynamic equilibrium, ensuring that uh, the uh, new East Asia summit, for example, was not going to be dominated only by China. So widening, it, the, the, widening the geographic definition of East Asia by bringing Australia, New Zealand, and India in. I think that was very much, you know, Indonesia, Singapore, and Japan at the time uh, were the drivers. But the dynamic equilibrium uh, uh, tagline, you know, was, was coined by, by Mati Natatogawa. And SBY himself was very, very uh, active, multilateral and global activism. He was, and his only apparently, you know, uh, to date, he is the only uh, former PKO officer who, who has been elected president. Uh, so, so he takes a uh, uh, very, very uh, personal interest in, in a lot of these uh, global activisms. So, the uh, the this was considered to be uh, an appropriate, you know, a strategic repositioning of Indonesia's opposition uh, during a, a time of uh, rising religious extremism and so on and so forth. And Indonesia also uh, started to be very active in promoting interfaith dialogues. And also because of this concerns about conflicts in the Middle East. And in the past, Indonesians tend to revere everything that comes from the Middle East, from the Holy Lands and so on. You know, everything that came from the Middle East is considered to be right and, 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 and you know, that Indonesia needs to follow. So now there is a conscious attempt when, when you have so much problems in the Middle East, there is a desire to provide some distance. And, and, and in the past, Indonesians, Islam is considered to be peripheral. The, the, the center of the Islamic world is always in the Middle East. And somehow, Islam in Southeast Asia is less, less to the ones in the, in the Middle East, you know, to, it's considered too syncretic, you know, too not pure enough. But when the problems of religious extremism, the Wahhabism and Salafism became an issue, there is, there is in fact, no longer this apologetic attitude toward our version of uh, Islam, you know, we are proud of it, you know, we're, we're, that we, we, we are in a different category where Islam can work together with di uh, tolerance, uh, with different religious uh, beliefs, with women empowerment and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, democracy also became a very important foreign policy asset. And Indonesia, as you know, it's always a case when you're newly converted to become very eager to preach to others as well, but in a, in a less preachy and finger-pointing manner. So Indonesia tried also to promote its democracy into the wider region, the uh, introduction of the Bali Democracy Forum beginning in, in 2008. And also within ASEAN, it can look at the development of ASEAN. 2003, Indonesia introduced a political uh, and security community, it started with a security community which argued that you cannot really only have a security community uh, between states, i.e., you know, the, the peaceful relations between states. But because a lot of the conflicts are internal in nature, you also need to pay more attention to peace within states. And in that respect, respect you know, the, the relations between the government and the governed between state and society becomes important. So for this, you know, you need to have a more inclusive political system. Democracy is, while it's not ideal, it's considered to be, to be the only way uh, to go about it. So uh, the ASEAN Charter also, in the new norms and values within the ASEAN Charter, uh, the introduction of democracy, human rights, rule of law, good governance, and so on. You know, that was very much driven uh, by Jakarta. Uh, so Indonesia was very active, and President SBY himself uh, was prominently uh, involved. Uh, he, he was very much regarded as a uh, foreign policy president. He was personally interested and he enjoyed uh, attending all the various uh, multilateral and global meetings. Uh, 
particularly because he speaks good English and he gets better reports outside than within the country, you know. <laughs> when, uh, when he came in, there was always this, you know, he was being hammered left, left right and centre for not performing well enough, despite the fact that Indonesia was not doing too badly. While outside, you know, he was being uh, fettered, he was being loaded. And he was assisted by two equally very, very uh, competent foreign ministers, very highly intellectual, uh, you know, some of the best uh, intellectuals uh, on foreign policy that Indonesia and the region has. You know, you have Has Dr. Hassan Wirayuda and you have uh, Dr. Martin Nagawa, who are not just uh, bureaucratic doers, but they're very conceptual also uh, and, and full of full, full of ideas. But n not everyone was happy, you know, with with the way that Indonesia's foreign policy uh, was handled uh, by President uh, uh, SBY. Towards the end of his rule, uh, there began to be a lot of criticisms because Indonesia is very active in the region globally, trying to be a peacemaker in the Middle East, trying to do different things, you know, in within ASEAN, trying to be active globally, climate change and open government, you know, you name it, Indonesia would be there. Uh, so there will always be this criticism. Where is the beef? You know, where does it end for us? So what, what is, you know, too much politics and security issues, you know, is uh, blah, blah, blah. And so this is not, not terribly uh, 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 beneficial. And also this criticism, Indonesia is always there willing to go in to jump in to assist uh, in diplomatic relations. But it would always be Malaysia or Singapore who would be able to leverage the economic gain. So, you know, the criticism was Indonesia was at the far front of the settlement of the Kamujan conflict. If you go to Kamboja, they're mostly Malaysian power plants or, uh, or hotels, you know, or even casinos probably. And, uh, uh, there was actually a floating casino in Cambodia and it's owned by Malaysians. Uh, and, and Indonesia was not there. Uh, uh, the same for Myanmar, you know, Indonesia is very active in assisting Myanmar's transition to democracy. Uh, but when it comes to real business, uh, Indonesia tends to lag behind. So there was a lot of criticisms uh, already. And then, uh, most of you who are following Indonesia's foreign policy will remember uh, Rizal Sukhsma's celebrated article in the Jakarta Post, uh, which shocked everybody, you know, is it time for an, a post-ASEAN uh, foreign policy for Indonesia? Uh, if you remember before the ratification, Pak Ong, but Ali Alatas and I went around trying to persuade parliament and civil society that we, Indonesia, should ratify ASEAN. But Yusuf Anandi and Rizal said, you know, we should not ratify the ASEAN Charter. It's better not to have a substandard charter than to have a charter. While I and Pak Ali Alatas said, it's better to have a charter where ASEAN, for the first time, is actually willing to put on paper the word democracy and human rights, which would never, never occurred, you know, so get get that and then and try to work on that later on. But there was this disappointment, this dilution of the ASEAN Charter and the fact that, you know, a lot of ideas, you know, why Indonesia is so active in Bali Democracy Forum because it's not getting anywhere within ASEAN in pushing for these values. So there was a suggestion that maybe, you know, uh, Indonesia should on, be committed to ASEAN but in a minimalist way. It should not be the corner of Indonesia's foreign policy but a corner of Indonesia's foreign policy. And, and, and by the way, you know, Rizal became very influential uh, as a foreign policy advisor for candidate Jokowi and also for President Jokowi Dodo in the first year of his presidency. And then this 1,000 zero enemies was also mocked by some, you know, is that there's a non-policy, you know, you can't be a everything to everybody. You can't say that you are friends to everybody. You know, you should be able to stand up for your principles and in fighting for your national in interest, sometimes you have to go ag against some countries. So, so, you know, a lot of political scientists and experts uh, uh, have uh, uh, mocked this. I was in a difficult position because I was partly in the government, you know. <laughs> so, so I have to keep my mouth shut most of the time. Uh, uh, now, but if you listen to the presidential campaign in 2014. As you know, SBY could not run uh, for the third term because under our constitutional amendment, uh, the, the, there is a fixed term now, ma maximum of two terms, two times five uh, uh, times, uh, two, uh, five years. And the two contending candidates, Joko Widodo and Prabowo, was not really regarded as an heir to SBY's legacy because uh, the Democratic Party did not really have a horse running in the, in the race. PDIP 
uh, Joko Widodo was mostly backed by uh, PDIP and Prabowo was backed by his new party. So they were both, you know, outliners in a, in a way. They were outsiders who were, uh, during uh, SBY's terms of office, were both in the opposition, very critical. So if you listen to, to the campaign at the time, to the discourse, you think that Indonesia is going to collapse any time. The country is going to the dog, you know, I mean, uh, everything was bad. And none was willing to openly pay tribute or recognize the achievements that have been made by Indonesia in the past 10 years. There was just de general the fiction that Indonesia is weak, that it was being taken advantage of. You know, it sounds very much like American presidential election, uh, that, you know, the, the country was so weak uh, and everything. And, uh, and um, hey, you know, in 2000 and uh, uh, 18, uh, as we are now entering presidential campaign, Prabowo has quoted a fiction saying that Indonesia will no, be no more in 2030, you know, uh, the doomsday scenario again. So this is you know, usually, usually the case. So it, it will collapse unless one of them would be uh, voted as president. So there was this competition to be, become the strongest leader, to be the most nationalistic, to be the most populist and poor people. Uh, as if the previous government was none of this, you know. Uh, and, 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 and then, you know, the SBY's foreign policy was regarded as simply pencitraan, image building. And I had to convince people, yeah, image is very important. If, because if your image is a, a chaotic country, dangerous for people to visit, no investors would come, no tourists would come, you know. So image is important. I mean, I mean reputation. Strictly would say, you know, my name, my good name. It is important. But by... By candidates, they say, you know, it's just image building, pencitraan, you know, it's dismissed like that. Not re realizing that image is important, reputation is important. And then we have very quickly during uh, uh, Jokowi's uh, nine campaign uh, pledges, uh, or Nawacita, I uh, highlighted the, the point about uh, uh, his foreign policy, uh, protecting and safeguarding the people. So, you know, people at the center of foreign policy. Uh, and of course, you know, continuing commitment to free and active foreign policy. And then, and then this is new, affirming Indonesia's identity as a maritime nation. But then you also uh, uh, notice this, despite the fact that Indonesia and the rest of ASEAN is entering ASEAN economic community and we are fully integrated regionally and globally, there is this continuing refrain, berdikari, berdiri di kaki sendiri, you know, self-reliance uh, in the economy. And then uh, Sukarno's Trisakti uh, was became, you know, to be politically sovereign, kedaulatan politik. Kemandirian ekonomi, ekonomi self-reliant, ke, ke, kebudayaan yang berkepribadian, you know, that's culturally distinctive. So this desire to have this robust nationalism, strong identity, to be independent, to be self-reliant, you know, the, the Sukarno's rhetorics uh, were making a strong comeback. And it's not a surprise in a way because Jokowi comes from the PDIP, the uh, Sukarno's uh, uh, former party uh, of PNI. And, and, and there was a conscious attempt from the very beginning to differentiate his foreign policy uh, uh, from that of uh, SBYs, that uh, the foreign policy would be more down to earth, more people oriented. It would not be 1,000 friends, zero enemies going all over the place, but will be focused on selected bilateral and regional engagements uh, geared towards economic uh, interests. Uh, but this is interesting. I think that this is an influence of uh, Rizal here, you know, the highlighted Indonesia's role as a middle power because then, you know, we can talk about theory, what middle power does. Uh, middle power actually is more active and norms building and coalition building and, and uh, 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 trying uh, to avoid in hierarchical international order and so on. So that is interesting because with, uh, Indonesia has never before really openly talked about being a middle power, though its behavior is that of a middle power. So this robust nationalism, vigorous protection of national interests, patriotism, so the talk about revolusi mental, mental revolution, bela negara, <laughs> and so on. But interestingly, despite all of these references to Sukarno's rhetorics, Jokowi actually shied away from Sukarno's lighthouse foreign policy and confrontational foreign policy. And it's mostly, Sukarno's foreign policy is mostly political in, in nature uh, to consolidate, you know, anti-colonial movement. And Sukarno was, of course, not terribly interested in economic uh, development. Uh, so 
if one looks at the content of the policy, it's more Suharto during the early period of the new order because it's very pragmatic, focusing on a few uh, 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 bilateral uh, uh, and regional relations and, and, and low key because uh, uh, Suharto, like, uh, like, like Jokowi, is also you know, low key. So if you remember in the uh, early days, the first year, I mean, I myself have, were rather concerned, you know, uh, not, not terribly uh, concerned, but rather concerned, while, while some people were, were more than concerned, that, that Indonesia's foreign policy would become too self-serving and transactional in nature, you know, cash on delivery, if there's no cash, no delivery, you know, uh, that it become too nationalistic, too inward looking, that it may go on on its own uh, and neglect ASEAN, it abandoning its regional and global commitments, which results in loss of all the gains made in a regional and international standing. And that, in fact, maybe it will not be interested in promoting values anymore because there's no money to be made in promoting democracy, pluralism, and moderate Islam, and so on. So before we go any further, because there'll be another 20 pages here, I can say outright, so that you're not too worried, that it's true that there have been some definite changes in foreign policy emphasis and priorities, and changes in, some, in foreign policy style, but in fact there's been more continuity than changes. Yeah? And, and in fact, Indonesia's foreign policy has not really deviated from the well-beaten track uh, in terms of principles, regional and material uh, commitments, because Indonesia's foreign policy is very much hampered or grounded in its constitutional mandate to be an active player in, in promoting uh, global peace. Uh, it has a free and active foreign policy, so that sets a framework within which it can uh, operate. And that the, we have a Foreign Relations Act, which actually spells out clearly you know, major bilateral, regional and multilateral commitments. So, in fact, in the past three years, uh, I'm happy to report that none of the concerns regarding Indonesia's foreign policy under Jokowi have materialized. And, and we, can, we have seen the complementary roles of the president and the vice president in, uh, on foreign policy, and there's a clear division of labor in attending international summitry. So the president, true, he's not, he gets very bored in attending multilateral meetings where there are endless speeches, so he focuses on bilateral issues on, uh, on, on uh, you know, he attends ASEAN and ASEAN related summits, he attends APEC, he attends G20. The rest, he's never been to the UN, he's never attended any of the NAM summits, he's never attended any of the uh, OIC summits or any of those summits where there are more than 50 people, you know. Uh, so he doesn't like attending that. While the vice president uh, has been uh, seconded, you know, to, to attend this. And at the same time, very interestingly, SBY used to have a foreign policy advisor and a foreign policy spokesman, the go-to person on foreign affairs, but at the same time helping to shape foreign policy from the palace. SBY had sometimes distinctive foreign policy from, from the foreign ministry. Now, Jokowi has not appointed any foreign policy advisor, so Riza Sukma was never brought in into into the uh, the system uh, and 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 he found it rather uncomfortable you know working from outside of the system being invited to sit in the high table as a director of CSIS that's one of the reasons why he he decides to go to London uh, because you know to avoid conflict with, with the foreign ministry but the foreign ministry is very much given the central role so all of the talking points on foreign policy comes from foreign ministry not, not from Jokowi's inner circle. There's not a single person in the whole of the state secretariat in charge of foreign policy. Now, I'm out of the vice president's office. No one in the vice president's office either, not a single one, uh, uh, who is in charge of foreign policy, either in the presidential uh, uh, office or in the vice president's office. So this is very much in the hands of the, uh, the foreign uh, ministry. Now, they have this emphasis on Indonesia's maritime identity. Uh, I won't talk too much about this because this is a new, you know, a very uh, complex issue in itself, but the fact that Indonesia wishes to see itself as a, to function as a global maritime fulcrum, not just physically because it is in the middle, uh, 
uh, of two oceans, but also, you know, in terms of strategic uh, uh, behavior. And, and, and there's uh, concerns about developing uh, various aspects uh, that would make Indonesia into a strong maritime uh, nation. Note here that Indonesia is not ter terribly ambitious yet, Paong. It only wants to be ma a, a strong maritime nation, not yet a maritime power. So, uh, uh, so as bangsa maritim, bukan kekuatan maritim yet. And here, the, uh, the, some of the uh, activities that have attracted a lot of attention, of course, the sinking of boats uh, by the minister, particularly of fisheries, Ibu, Ibu Susi, uh, which show that you know, it was tough policy which upsets a lot of countries, uh, but uh, she continues to go ahead, even though the coordinating minister and the vice president says, you know, turn it down, Susi. And I said, she said, you know, this is this is my mandate. So, so she could continues to do that. Uh, and uh, I think you have also noticed a very demonstrative assertion of Indonesia's ownership the, of the Natuna's uh, uh, exclusive economic zone uh, during a recent uh, scuffle, 2016, when uh, there have been incidents with uh, Chinese uh, uh, fishing boats accused of illegally fishing in Natuna's uh, EEZ and in one time, one incident with the coast, uh, Chinese Coast Guard. So there was another co uh, incident uh, that led to Indonesia, the president calling for a cabinet meeting on a warship that actually impounded the, 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 the boat, you know, that was very symbolic. And uh, also focus on maritime diplomacy, finalizing the uh, uh, maritime uh, borders dis uh, discussions and uh, negotiations. And then, of course, you know, the South China Sea's uh, issue is, continues to be very important, and Indonesia uh, supports the, uh, the, uh, the signing of the binding code of conduct. And then the IORA, this is the Indian Ocean Regional Association, or IORA, it was already established in 1997, but it was not doing too much. It, uh, it meets every two years at ministerial level, uh, but not much was going on because much, most of the focus was on the uh, East Asia region. And uh, in, it was when Indonesia chaired the IORA that it uh, organized the summit for the first time in, 19, uh, in 2017. And now with the talks about Indo-Pacific, uh, the Indonesian foreign minister uh, has talked actually explicitly about IORA as being part of the building block for uh, a regional architecture in the Indo-Pacific. Now, the foreign ministry uh, has outlined these four priorities as uh, a follow-up of the vision outlined by, by, uh, by Jokowi and, and Jeka uh, in their Nawachita. Namely, first, protecting of, uh, national sovereignty, of course, then protecting Indonesian nationals abroad, economic diplomacy, and then enhancing Indonesia's regional and uh, uh, international profile. Now, very quickly, uh, because we, ha we don't have much time, the uh, national sovereignty, the two main issues here, uh, preventing the internationaliz internationalization of the Papua separatist movement, and secondly, speeding up, speeding up negotiations to delineate national boundaries. And on the South China issues, Indone uh, Indonesia has regarded the, uh, the naval uh, action in the EEZ of Natuna as law enforcement. So it has continued to refuse to respond to China's uh, complaints, saying that it is not a political issue, it's a law enforcement issue. And protection of Indonesian nationals abroad, this is uh, being highlighted uh, because, uh, you know, particularly with domestic workers, uh, there are up to 4 million Indonesians uh, abroad, uh, not that big actually, uh, and uh, the, about 90% of them are uh, domestic workers and of those about 65% are females uh, in vulnerable positions. And so focus has been uh, on, on uh, uh, how to, uh, to protect them. Also scandals about enslavement of Indonesian shipmen on boats has also attracted attention. So this has become a uh, priority uh, for Indonesia. But also I'm, I'm sure that all of the Indonesians here, if you have mobile phones, the moment you travel overseas, uh, you receive SMS. Uh, informing you where the Indonesian uh, uh, embassies and so on. So this is, you know, to, um, uh, to help assist Indonesian nationals uh, overseas as well. And also to work with ASEAN uh, to develop a regional framework protection, uh, protecting uh, migrant workers. 
And then I spend a lot of time on economic diplomacy here because this is really the focus of, uh, of Jokowi's foreign policy. Uh, there's so many uh, objectives in the economic diplomacy uh, for FDI, for infrastructure project, for, uh, for maintaining traditional export markets, seeking new markets, attracting tourists. Indonesia has unilaterally given 169 free visa you know, to different countries, including to Israel and Taiwan, which Indonesia does not have relations with. Uh, this despite some concerns by the security and intelligence uh, force. Uh, they are, they are, you know, Indonesian, the Indonesian uh, tourist ministry said, you know, if Singapore can do it, why can't we do it? Because there is a desire to, to, to get some of the spillover from uh, uh, Singaporean tourists. And then uh, Indonesia is also uh, seeking new destinations for its business and investment. There is also a uh, uh, desire to, to seek energy and food security, placement and better protection of Indonesian migrant workers, as well as uh, SIPA negotiation with several uh, countries. Now, this is very interesting, which caused a lot of uh, debates when it was first introduced. So the Jokowi government identified key countries which it should give special attention to. And then, because most of the problem is internally, there's a lot of bottlenecks and so on, he actually assigned ministers, some senior ministers, to assist in handling this, this uh, uh, as a liaison of this, the, uh, different countries. And you'll be happy to see that two countries, two ASEAN countries, Malaysia and Singapore, are being handled by very senior ministers. Uh, and, and then uh, each of the other ministers you know, handle several other countries. And, uh, and you notice that Russia and, and, and the United States are blamed together. Singapore is handled by one coordinating minister. Malaysia is handled by one coordinator. Russia has been given to Ibu Susi to handle. So, <laughs> so, uh, so if they got problems, she's the go-to person you know, for, uh, for them. And, and Indonesia has actually signed seven strategic uh, uh, and comprehensive uh, partnerships already. And with new partners, so despite these ideas of only focusing on several key uh, partners, in fact, uh, Indonesia is also very active in finding uh, new partners, tapping new potentials. Uh, greater interest now in the Middle East, not simply because of religious sympathy uh, or, or Palestinian issue, but also because of their you know, uh, uh, economic potentials. And with Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, there's also increasingly close economic relations. Uh, it, the president has visited all of those countries, made state visits. And if you remember, uh, the, the, the Saudi king visited Indonesia with 1,500 delegations when uh, uh, hundreds of them are princes, you know. <laughs> and, and, they, and they stayed for nine days in Indonesia at the time. And then with Africa, this is very interesting. Very, very, uh, besides the Indonesian, uh, the Indian Ocean Dream countries, this intensive cooperation with Africa. And now, just recently, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, recently, we just finished uh, yesterday the uh, Indo Indonesia Africa Forum. This is the first Africa Forum, and next year there is a plan for an infrastructure forum. Now, ASEAN, you'll be happy, Paong, it remains the cornerstone of Indonesia's foreign policy. Although in Bahasa Indonesia it doesn't make sense, the semantic about a or the, because we don't have that, you know. We just say Sokoguru, which in fact is not a a cornerstone at all, is central pillars. And Sokoguru, actually, if you look at the Joglo, there are four central pillars. But it just says Sokoguru, and ASEAN is the only one that merits this uh, terms of Sokoguru. So it remains a Sokoguru, and it's been reiterated uh, uh, by, by the foreign minister. Uh, uh, and the president also has uh, reiterated you know, that ASEAN is important to him. But he emphasized over and over again that ASEAN must be to the benefit of the common people as well, not just uh, uh, for uh, uh, big businesses. And you know, the role of ASEAN as for strategic autonomy, and also he uh, called for stronger co uh, security cooperation and, and stronger centra uh, unity. And there's also, uh, 
in growing interest again. The sub-regional economic cooperation has been revived mostly, and 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 because of the security threats uh, related to Marawi and and the Abu Sayyaf kidnappings, these initiatives in developing closer trilateral cooperation. And this is not just a coordinated patrol; it's actually central command that is uh, you know more joint patrol in the Sulu and Sabah Sea. Now this Islamic world. It's not been neglected. Indonesia has continued uh, to play this active role in trying to show that uh, you know Islam should not be regarded as violent or, 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 or you know anti-pluralism, uh, and uh, and in fact, maybe you will say that this is a senseless effort, but. Indonesia actually tried to mediate. If you remember, the early 2016, President Jokowi sent Foreign Minister Retno to Riyadh and uh, to Tehran first, and to Riyadh to try uh, to uh, you know tone down the conflict between the two countries because Indonesia has good friends with both countries, uh, and also has established initiated the establishment of contact group with an OIC, and and. Uh, Vice President Yusuf Kala has, has openly said that you know the problems in most Islamic countries is not simply because of internal international interventions. This international interventions comes because of the state failure, and Indonesia feels that it has legitimacy to say it because it has also experienced the same thing. So uh, uh, we have also problems, you know, experience that kind of problem, and uh, re-emphasizing again, you know, this uh, all the points that that uh, uh, SBY has already uh, initiated, and. Jokowi recently visited Kabul. This is the first visit by Indonesian president since President Sukarno in 61. So this is, this is also an important development. And, and for some of you may be interested to know that Nahdlatul Ulama has already established branches uh, in Kabul. Uh, because uh, the Kabul uh, Afghan society is more like Nahdlatul Ulama type, you know, more feudal. Uh, Muhammad, less than Muhammadiyah, uh, which is much more uh, urban and egalitarian. The Palestinian issue also continues to be very important. I will go there very uh, quickly. And, uh, and Indonesia hosted an extraordinary summit uh, in 2016. And then the humanitarian issues, the Rohingya issue. Uh, remember that Ibu Radno has carried out shuttle diplomacy between uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh, very quietly talking to both leaders and, and, and avoided megaphone diplomacy. So that's why uh, she's able to talk uh, to them and also uh, providing uh, assistance. And if you notice the humanitarian assistance, Indonesia has already started to build a hospital in Rakhine State. I remember at the time, the Islamic uh, number of Islamic NGO came to the uh, vice president's office. They had a plan to build hospital in the Rakhine state, mostly to serve the uh, uh, the Muslims uh, communities there. And then the vice president said, "No, you have to show that this is not only for Muslims, and that in Indonesia Muslims and Buddhists can work together." So he called immediately the chairman of Walubi, the uh, the Buddhist association, and made the Indonesian and uh, the Buddhist and Islamic NGOs cooperate together and make sure that the hospitals is also available to all religions, so not just to one to one and uh, one group. So that the hospital itself is part of you know peace building effort. And the president also visited Cox Bazar recently. Now. Indonesia uh, is also now focusing on South-South cooperation, and it has just announced that it will build a single agency for Indonesian aid. So this is an interesting development, not just an aid recipient now, now Indonesia uh, is also at the point of trying to become an aid giver as well. So at the multilateral level, uh, it's still the same as before. and. It's true that President Jokowi Dodo is not interested in the Bali Democracy Forum personally. Throughout the SBY period, he always chaired the Bali Democracy Forum. He would sit for days, you know, the whole day. Uh, Jokowi has not attended the Bali Democracy Forum, but the Demo Bali Democracy Forum has continued at the ministerial level. Uh, usually the vice president goes there. And recently it has opened the Tunis chapter, and there's plan to develop uh, other chapters as well. So in conclusion, uh, Indonesia's foreign policy under Joko Widodo has not merely been transactional, thank God, and it's all limited to a few key bilateral relations. While there's emphasis to particular bilateral and regional partners, the search for new markets has also made 
Indonesia's economic diplomacy much more global. Uh, it's just you know, it's just by necessity, and uh, and also the economic imperatives have not led to a neglect of non-economic commitments. ASEAN remains the cornerstone of Indonesia's foreign policy. And as I said, there's a workable division of labor between the president and the vice president. And I, I must say that I hold my hat to Ibu Retno because she's truly courageous and tireless. Uh, because, you know, trying to build peace between Iran and Saudi is a chaotic thing, but, and you're not going to be received well, you know, uh, uh, but she went. And then on, on the Rohingya issue, it's very difficult with Aung San Suu Kyi and so on, but she continues to go and very patient, even she's rebuffed sometimes. And the, the good thing is that the foreign ministry is well trusted, unlike in some other countries, where they have not appointed ambassadors or, you know, uh, and so on. And Indonesian diplomats are now being used as marketeers, so that's, uh, you know, they have to be able to talk knowledgeably about, about Indonesian economy. So very sorry I've gone too long, but, but, on, and, uh, but it's a lot of uh, material to cover. Thank you very much for your attention.